like a mind have a understanding that people should mind their business and that's it like people should anybody like from my mom my family to my school mind your business because I, I actively can make this decision on my own and I have to I actively have to live with this and I'm okay with living with this one you know like my dysphoria um for, for my body is that right so like I say my breast um sometimes I may like you know weight gain bloat things of that nature and it just throws me off because now I'm like I feel fuller like I feel like a natural woman and it just throws me completely off I'm like I don't I don't want thick thighs I don't want none of this so until so that goes until so that's how my conversation with my therapist started around like what does possibly taking testosterone look like um and we just went through a series of questions and assessments and just like scenarios um and then you know finding out that like my heart's a little weak so i'm putting my heart is a little weak right i have like people are born with a, um a murmur and it will have to be like um almost like a homage or like awakening those are still too like uh i like homage more like it's you know like i was saying earlier these shoes are the first shoes growing up in florida and like knowing that you like the same gender being black some of those things just didn't they just didn't add up together and so a part parts of me just wasn't able to be who i wanted to be all the time and so it get it got tiring after a while. It actually became like laborious on me mentally, spiritually, emotionally, going through high school. I went to performing arts high school. And so singing and performing and playing my violin were like what I did. And I was kind of like not able to transition through those. Being about to graduate high school, having really like socially developed around certain stuff. And then just feeling like parts of me just didn't fit on like certain spectrums like I knew I liked girls but I didn't know like what what kind of person I was to like girls and what that looked like and so my family and they didn't force anything on me a lot of times but they knew like they wanted me to look a certain way or be a certain way out in public or just in general because that was like the status quo down there like and so from getting my hair done to buying shoes everything was like real prim and proper and extremely feminine in some regards so like wearing tennis shoes and things like that like i could if we was going to like a ballpark but just to wear it as part of an outfit like eh, not so much so i have worked at chick-fil-a chick-fil-a was my first job out of this place called Regency, Regency Mall. And I had saved, getting ready to graduate, like I said. And I saw these shoes over in Journeys. And I saw them, and it was the only pair like that. And I like Converse's. I mean, everybody, everyone knows I like Converse's, but I wasn't really allowed to wear them because they were seen as like a, a more masculine shoe in my family. So um, I was just like, I, got, I really want to get those. And like, I. Like I said, I worked, but my people was more so like they wanted to know what I was spending my money on before I spent it. So they sure I would be like, well, I want to go buy some shoes. And, you know, they'd ask. And at this time, um, people just have their their history around why they ask questions. And so. My mom really not knowing how to like not not that she knew how to talk to me but like she knew that I, I like girls and so that was just very different um for her and she's a teacher so kind of came some of the embarrassment of people knowing back then and so like she was real big on what I bought because people that knew me knew her and you know, like I say buying tennis shoes buying converses was just not on her radar so one day I was like you know screw it it's my money I knew how to cash my check and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm just not going to give her my money. Because I would come home and give her my money after I got paid. She would save it or, you know, do X, Y, and Z, whatever, whatever for the house or make sure I had what I needed. So I'm like, I'm just not going to give, I'm not going to give her the money. So I didn't give her the money. And I went to the mall. And I bought these shoes. 
And I came home and they had uh, white shoelaces when I first bought them. I didn't change them to the blue ones until like later. And I started changing the, the, the shoelaces out just just because I like the, the contrast of color. And my mom was, she wasn't like infuriated, but she was very much like, why would you spend your money on that? And kind of like taking away like, you know, it's your money. You may, you can make a decision to more so like this decision that she made can like detrimentally, you know, hurt us, things of that nature. She doing the best she can as a parent. No, exp no excuses, just an explanation, right? So now we have different conversations in some aspects, but back then it was very much like I had done this really bad thing and I was like, no, that's, that's not what's happening. You know what I'm saying? Like she wanted me to go return them, she tried to throw them away, yada, yada, yada. So like these shoes became like a slight level of contention for me and my mom. Okay. Um, for me and my mom, because for her, it was like a, a blatant disregard to her respect, um, what she wanted in the house, teach me how to save money, even though I was, um, I was doing a good job. But like, we kind of went back and forth about these shoes. And I had to like, that was one of the first times I had like a kind of a face to face conversation. My mom was like, you may not like my decisions in life, but I know what works for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know, I know that even down to me singing classical music and playing the violin, I know what works for me. I know what makes me feel good about what I wear and how I talk to people and who the people I talk to and who I'm around to keep me functional in that space. And I was like, Mom, you can't keep just thinking that because you don't like it, I got to do away with it. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, that that whole phrasing right there was just telling the parts of therapy moving forward around, like, how I had had a hard time if during a breakup, I would automatically think, oh, you're just leaving. You know what I'm saying? So, like, just kind of remembering, like, what these shoes have took me through. So, I've had them since high school. I'm 38 now, so 28, 20 years. My shoe size ain't changed. Um, so, yeah, I would have to call these, like, an homage because I don't wear them often. But when I do, I don't mind the cracks and the, the bruising. I don't, I don't, I purposely, like, don't overly clean them because I don't wear them a lot, but I like the the grit because it's it's I went through some stuff, you know what I'm saying? Like after I went graduated high school, I made some real bad decisions down in Orlando, my first year of college, had to transfer to Hickory, North Carolina, which is a predominantly white institution, and I had these shoes with me. I had these shoes through a breakups, marriages, deaths. I'm thinking I'm not I think I wore them to somebody's funeral. It's a good thing for us, mm -hmm. and she, me, and my ex-wife are really good friends. Okay. Um, but just been through these, like even my ex-wife saw these, and she was like, "Where did you get these from?" And I was like, "Yo, these are my shoes." You know what I'm saying? Like, these are my, these are mine. And she was like, "You want me to wash them?" Absolutely not. Um, like I said, the story around them is just this is this is not how I how I started, but this was very much like my first face-to-face -face mom. I I'm allowed to I'm allowed to have orange Converse. I'm allowed to do that, and it actually makes sense to an artistic kid. Like, I went to performing arts high school. I should have colored shoes at this point. You know what I'm saying? And so, now, my mama see him, and she's like, you still have these shoes. I do still have these shoes. I'm going to keep these shoes. And I wear them proudly whenever I have to. That I purposely keep color out of my life. Um... Yes, as a safety mechanism. Um, and also because color down south, pink was girls, blue was boys, and I knew that I didn't really fit in either of those. So I was like always looking for something colorful. But that down there was either you are like weird or you're definitely LGBT, you know, gay or whatnot. And just people would subject you to their form of scrutiny based on their interpretation of what you wore, how you dressed, um, just real big down there. And, and like, my family is, is like, they're, they're prominent in Jacksonville, you know? Like, my grandmother worked for a place called Urban Research. Um, my aunts worked for Prudential, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Um, and they just weren't, like, receptionists or, like, front desk clerks. Like, my grandma damn near ran Urban Research, which is a, a, a consulting firm that 
So like up here, Giant, Safeway, Harris Cedar, all the places, right? They put out new products or reoccurring products. Before those products hit the floor, they have to go through testing. And so there are testing centers that they set up for people to come through. So they have that in Jacksonville. My grandmother ran it. So like people knew my family and people were real bad about reporting what they thought that I was doing. You know what I'm saying? And so if I'm outside with a group of friends and I'm wearing something, you know, vibrantly pink or whatever, X, Y, and Z, then automatically, oh, your granddaughter doing so fine and she gonna get a boyfriend, yada, yada, yada. That whole conversation happens. I'm just like, how do we get here? Or if I'm outside and I'm wearing like something too dark, then I'm a thug. So I just, it was just really odd. So I was just like, I'm gonna just wear jeans and t-shirts my whole life. And that's just where it's been for me. You know what I'm saying? And so the environment dictate who I was allowed to be, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Cause I, um, my grandma held it down if it went too far. But again, if somebody saw me in public and they thought that I was doing something a little too gay, which could have been talking to a girl, I didn't do like hand holding all that stuff. Like that's just not me. But I could have been talking to a girl that I could have been around somebody that somebody knew was gay and they go back and tell my family. And now I'm fighting with my honor or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Or like not physically fighting, but like going back and forth with like having to explain why this is happening. And I process things a little late. So some people in my life, my friends were like, why aren't you asking your family why, who that person was that was there and why they're in the same place do they got a problem with it like so I wasn't picking up on how to defend myself or how to like actively advocate for myself right and so because of that as people do they kind of just ate off of the silence um, and they formed their own opinions of oh well this is why you shouldn't be doing this because if you don't know what, what you're doing then why you you know trying to be this way and don't you know that this is one of the more um uh, un unhealthy ways to live and it was just a bunch of sh stuff shit just based off of their opinions and so um, I just I was just scared you know what I'm saying like I was very afraid I didn't even want to talk to dudes like some of my friends you know they were like well fuck it if I can't do this with no girl I'm gonna just do it with a guy F it I just wasn't trying to do nothing because I was I wasn't focused on any of that so that wasn't even in my, in my purview my focus was to get out of high school and just maintain a level of connection with people that understood me as a person. Sing some classical music, play the violin, make a career out of it, hopefully. You know what I'm saying? And so even with that, I still had to put a cap on... They didn't call it weird. I was just always different, right? I had to always put a cap on my difference, right? And so not being able to fully, like, get into that space or, like, hang around my other queer LGBTQI identified uh, classmates, classmates at the time and whatnot and really have conversations that stunted my growth around just developing like who I who I could be. You know, like I didn't get to parts of who I who I am now well into my thirties, damn near. You know what I'm saying? Just out of fear, out of how to reprogramming, out of not knowing. Um, and I don't I don't blame my family, I don't gotta say this, but I don't blame them because everyone was doing the best that they can. I just know now that I have the words, I, I actively challenge them in their spaces around like, like I got a little, I got a, um, a little cousin and for a minute, he's a, first of all, he's a kid. So he's just gonna act as kids do, right? With family. Oh, he had a little soft, maybe he, and I was like, he's four. He's fucking four. You know what I'm saying? Like give the kid a break. And now I can say that because I'm grown. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm living in DC, I do my own thing. I don't ask y'all for nothing. We can have this conversation. But it's the same conversation that could have been had 20 years ago. If people would just say, this is a valid expression of a person. This person is making a statement that I may be unfamiliar with and in that I'm uncomfortable. But acknowledging that space is a lot of, a lot of emotional intelligence, which until, I mean, people have always had emotional intelligence. Actively acting in it and seeing it as like a group participation or like a community thing is something new. Um, and so, yeah, like, I think a part, like, parts of me weren't forced to, like, just mull through high school, but it was a, a defense mechanism just to be like, I, I sing because I'm gifted, I play the violin because I'm gifted, let me just get through high school. Um, and so now those are kind of a detriment because those gift things didn't really connect to me as a person. It was just something that I did 
Um, and now I'm like, that's actually what I, it's, it's what I do. You know what I'm saying? Like singing, writing music, like all those things are things that I do. Teaching is great. Like I love to teach. I'm good at it. But working in the arts field, working on set designs, working on plays, working on costumes, makeup, all those things I like get very overjoyed about, you know? And so that was another thing too. I was like, this is my first piece of color in high school that I got on my own and I really love my high school. I really love what I did. I really love what I learned. Um, and I just, I just wish I could have took more of that with me and actually done something with it. Like, I wish I had gone to Juilliard. You know, I got accepted into Juilliard for a ride, I didn't go. I, I just wish I would have traveled overseas to England to their conservatories and like done a little bit more work over there. I wish, I guess there's a lot of things that I wish about especially getting these shoes was like the end of high school and just moving forward right and so it was like what I remember and my step towards my success moving forward whatever whatever but it's also a reminder of like 20 years I kind of left but like those those years I didn't get to have you know like shit I, I could have taken, taken these shoes a lot of places you know and I, I still did some great things I still went some cool places but it was again something I did whereas like these shoes they're they here like they are being they gonna stand on their own and I kind of just wish I had did that more you know so I think now that I see them and I look at them on days that I want to wear them I'm real intentional about the outfit I wear because that's like my point of I get to stand in this now you know what I'm saying like I get to I get to really show up me and my shoes and all the dings and discolorations or whatever, whatever. But these pair, they they symbolize like me standing in the face to face. Here I am. You know what I'm saying? Like whether you like it or not, this is what it is. So. <laughs> and that's that. So. You no. Know. It's transitioning a lonely journey. Um, for me, it, it, it can be and it should be in some regards. It can be depending on the kind of conversation you have with, with your support system. Um, it can be if even if you're having good conversation with your support system, how you're actively engaging with your transition. Um, and it should be because you want to spend some time getting to know the parts of yourself that are evolving in that transition. Um, and I think like if you're not aware of how the evolution looks and first like transition isn't always taking testosterone. Um, transitioning looks different for everyone to get to their, what they feel their body should be, how their body should look. Different stages of transitioning. So I am not like an expert. I'm just giving you what I know. Um, from my experience, right? So you have individuals that are on a, on a HRT, human, um, I'm going to get this wrong right now because I kind of put myself on the spot. Anyway, so you have like um, individuals who take either estrogen or testosterone to physically change their appearance, their body chemistry to be more aligned with whom they are, right? Um, you have individuals who are, let's say that growing up, someone identified as like very masculine or very feminine, and then they realize that I'm more gender non-conforming or non-binary. And then kind of what that transition looks like. Um, it may look like changing a, a, like a appearance in the tire. It might look like um, having top surgery. It might look like um, getting on like different dosages of hormones so you can grow facial hair. Um, so from my, from my knowledge, it's, it's it's different depending on how, what, what results you want. And I, I don't know if I'm saying it the right way, but like what's your more, what is your desired result in getting into the body that you want to be, or that you need to be in and that you know you are. Um, and I think too, even trying to like get through that conversation, I'm sitting here listening to myself talk, I'm like, damn, because so many people are so sensitive around certain words when it comes to like transitioning, right? So we don't want to say, you were born this way, we say, uh, you know, assigned gender at birth. We don't want to say taking hormones, we use it correct. But at the end of the day, it's all the same damn thing, you know what I'm saying? And so I think what it boils down to is doing what you got to do in a safe way, 
to get to where you need to be as a person so that you're whole, so that you feel at your optimal level of functionality, so that the world, not the world, but like the respect that you're looking for, even if it's not given, you still feel valid knowing that you are respected. Do I think it would be beneficial if the language around transitioning was more complete and concise? Um, yes, because um, that's data, right? And so people kind of look at data and they, they get the definition, they get what's happening in theory. Um, but the goal and the, the hope is that we're not just looking at the numbers around individuals who are transitioning to have more conversations. We're actively looking at someone. So what I want to say is that doing away with the this is an experience kind of thing and looking at it like this is reality. This is this individual's like an experience is going on a hot air balloon ride, you know, swimming with sharks. This shit happens every day for us. And so being able to hope that that's the goal and all this stuff is to be able to have that kind of understanding be like permeated. Like this is not something that's going to go away or that's erasable or I understand that people can detransition. Fine. But even in that, there are still aspects of them that are going to be queer, LGBTQIA, a asexual, all those things. Right. So you're not going to do away with that. You're just going to change the appearance of the person. So either way, they're not going to align with what you think. So just getting down to the understanding of this is really happening and it's not just a, an afterthought or something happened to me growing up or I had a bad experience. This is really what's happening. The same as like serial killers. I hate to put it on the same line, but like the same as people are, are birthed and are serial killers, it's a real experience for them and their family. It's a real experience for me and my family. It's a real experience for other people who are transitioning and the people that, that are in their lives living this thing every day. And I think when it becomes fetishized and, and overly like publicized is when it gets watered down and people's opinions aren't checked, right? And so when your opinions aren't checked, you think that you're right and you can just go around saying whatever you gotta say because, oh, this is how I think, this is how I feel. And now realizing that I get that, but in a lot of places, there's still some black and white of how things need to be approached and responded to. And you just can't keep going around misgendering people because you don't know. But again, the conversation starts with what data is being put out there, what is being um, understood, who is being studied. You know, there is not enough information done around black and brown people who are transitioning there's a lot of lingo around it there's a lot of awareness around people being two-spirit people being intersex right but it's still like um, a quantitative qualitative kind of data outlook it's not it's, it's to me it's still not as connected or like meshing for it to be like these are people and i think what happens is like our blackness shows up first our blackness is, is then like calculated into, well, if you are this level, then these things are okay. But if you still got to work on this, then why are you doing that? And I don't really understand where that comes from, but I know it's real. And I know that there are some people who put parts of their transition, like me, put parts of their transition off on that concept, right? Of like, oh, I haven't graduated this or my family doesn't doesn't approve of this so i need to wait on all of this <laughs> i appreciate it and like realizing now that like and i'm in therapy so like i'm dealing with like the imposter syndrome and the familial aspects of that and whatnot but like understanding that that thought process has been evolving for like 20 plus years and in that 20 years i have devoided myself of myself so it's going back and having some real conversations with like my eight-year-old self, my 12-year-old self, and I'm calling out numbers because throughout the game, it from like seven until about 21, gender and body dysphoria was a thing that was happening with me as far as like what was going on, who and what am I? You know what I'm saying? And so like having to go back and talk to those parts of myself and be like, hey dude, we're good. 
actually this who you are and who you were then is where I'm trying to get to now at 38 so how can we connect you know what I said okay 12 year old Lynn I see you know what I'm saying like I should have engaged more with like theater and makeup and things I like that because now I want to do that as, as a person so it's going back and just talking to the people and saying we're going to get through this and it's okay and apologizing and figuring out of, of those voided spaces what can be replenished what can be taken away um and just what needs to be done to kind of shift and sort to be the version of myself right and i think a lot of that is going back to the imposter syndrome because i have a lot of opinions about myself from other people but i don't have a statement of truth from myself about who i am and so it is developing that it's understanding like once once i say this is who i am out loud i am allowed to live up to that potential so just being okay with that just being okay that's the next challenge that's the next task at hand um and i think it's a part of growth i think that like kind of like these shoes like somebody like converse has come colors again you know what i'm saying you're gonna get them all the time right but this is the only pair that was like that and i haven't seen in me i haven't seen another person with these pair with this pair and so it is like not so much in the in the in its sol solidarity but in like their oneness how do they how 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 to stand out like this shoe in my oneness right for whatever reason nobody bought it it was supposed to be for me i feel and it's the shoe how like how does that all matriculate to my personhood right like um so yeah that's what i got <laughs> Mm-hmm. How would I define body dysphoria? Body dysphoria is your brain and your body don't, they don't match on what you have as a person. So my brain actively is like, why do we still have breasts? Every day I look in the mirror and my, my brain's like, we can do this. Like we can handle this. I need you to go ahead, call the doctor, get us in there. It's going to be a quick in and out. We ain't got much. Just go ahead and get this thing done so we can feel better. Like... <laughs> And I'm, I'm sitting now, it's, and it's like, it's, and this is the odd part, right? Because your brain usually, my brain is usually rational. I'm like, okay, my brain, it makes sense. Go ahead and do it. This one, it, like my imposter syndrome is a whole different beast because it's just like, but if you do that, then, you know, what about this? And my brain's like, bro, we've dealt with you. We've handled you. Like we about to medicate you if you don't go away. So we need for you <laughs> because Solyndra, what are we doing these things? I'm not like, what is this not yes? We can do this better. So um, it is like my brain and my, my body and parts of my heart are like, this just does not align with us. And just falling into the okayness, you know what I'm saying? And that's a big, that like, just that's a big step because it's almost like you have for, for me, having to like, not really identify that something is wrong and that was the first thing I had to take like there's nothing wrong with my body it's just there I have extra parts that's just, and I had to like kind of boil down to that after like a couple of months of therapy around it um but just my therapist being like they're just extra parts and you know there are some people who don't want to have an arm and so they go and you know they get it removed you know it's just finding the okayness in what's okay for me after being told and for it with you know told this this is this is what okayness is for you this is what okayness has to look for you in order for you to get this in order for you to get this kind of support in order for you to get to this place in life like this is what it had this is what you have to look like and knowing kind of growing up in that and then knowing every day this is not how i feel i do not feel like wearing no dress i don't feel like i don't feel like wearing no bra on me like i just don't want to you know what i'm saying i just what is the point so um yeah but yeah it's just when, out, when when your body and your brain they're on two separate wavelengths and that after a while your brain will be the your brain will take over because it does impact like it's impacting me emotionally and like in relationships because 
if I feel that I can't show up as my whole self in my body, I can't do it for my partner. Which is which can, which becomes truth, right? It doesn't start off true, but it becomes true because I haven't I, I haven't done my work around that yet. You know what I'm saying? And so it is just like I actively am like I got to call and just have a conversation with my therapist and say, hey, I'm ready for this surgery. I have to like make sure that the support system that I have, I got them around and just do it and just actually have like a mind, have a understanding that people should mind their business. And that's it, like people should, anybody like from my mom, my family to my school, mind your business because I, I actively can make this decision on my own and I have to, I actively have to live with this and I'm okay with living with this one. You know, like my dysphoria, um, for, for my body is that right so like I say my breast um, sometimes I may like you know weight gain bloat things of that nature and it just throws me off because now I'm like I feel fuller like I feel like a natural woman and it just throws me completely off I'm like I don't I don't want thick thighs I don't want none of this so until that goes until that's how my conversation with my therapist started around like what does possibly taking testosterone look like um, and we just went through a series of questions and assessments and just like scenarios. Um, and then, you know, finding out that like my heart's a little weak. So I'm putting my heart is a little weak. Right. I have like people are born with a, um, a murmur. And then if it doesn't go away, it can get dragged a little worse. Right. So mine's a little worse because I still have it. You know what I'm saying? So um, and so they're just actively like, you know, Taking testosterone comes with some biological changes. So you might have an issue with your liver, problem with your pancreas, X, Y, and Z. And so how much of that stress do you want to look at now that may possibly happen moving forward and you have a heart murmur? You have this, you may have to have surgery on that joint. You know what I'm saying? I was like, uh, I'm really not sure because now I'm actively saying which one is more important. You know what I'm saying? Like they're both equally valid. But I really value my life a little bit more than taking testosterone. Just a little bit. <laughs> Even if um, that means that the, the, the resolution of who I see myself is, uh, being isn't totally met. And so then I opened the conversation with me and my therapist to talk about just different levels of hormones and what that looked like, right? So um, ceasing my cycle and what that looked like and how those changes would affect my body. Um, they taught me about different foods I could eat that will increase like muscle intake, hair growth, shots I could take for that, um, shots that like I can probably take if I want to like gain more muscle mass. Um, and so they just opened the door for my options. Um, and, and really that actually got me more back into like, well, if you're saying that I can like eat certain things, um, that will really help change my body composition to the space that I wanted to be in and talking about like going really getting the gym, right? So now is now I'm back into like a I can do this without and it's not that I'm afraid, but I can do this without hurting myself, still become the version of myself I wanna be. People can mind their business. Um, and I don't have to put myself myself into like too 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 much risk, right? And like the other half is the conversation around people are not talking to black women who are transitioning to become black men and what that looks like, what that what that means, what that comes with, the responsibility that you are taking on, especially when it comes to t telling your people like. And it, and it breaks away a couple of like historical stigmas and bias right because of course black men are supposed to be seen as like the stand-up ones and yada 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 but you know it's, it's not a wrong concept because black men people should be stand-up people you know what i'm saying um but i don't think that people are giving a lot of our transitioning especially our youth the advantage of that conversation of saying but in america and moving forward, as you turn 25 and 30 and 33 and 40, and you've gone through being inappropriately um, 
scrutinize or you've gone through police brutality and then after the fact they're like oh my bad and then they are misgendering you like how much of that do you really want to go through to be a black man like how much responsibility do you want to take on um that you're not ready to take on right now because you can't run from it once you take that step and the world starts calling you sir people gonna cross the street a little quicker you know what i'm saying People are going to follow you around a little quicker. They're going to call the police on you a little quicker. And if you're living the life like that, then you're, you're, you're going to move down that road. You know what I'm saying? And so now the, your transition story is kind of out, out, out the way. Now you're just a statistic. Not what's the point, because I get the point, but how is that relevant? You know what I'm saying? And that's just me. Like, how, how, how did you... I, transitioning is, is, is for ourselves, right? And we get to do it how we need to, right? And then because it's one of those things that people see, how did you represent how this is relevant to you? You know, like, and so I kind of look at it like, like that. And so for me, even now of my students, they'll ask me like, are you gonna like start taking testosterone? Are you gonna like, your voice gonna change? Yada, yada, yada. And I was like, no. Nah. And they're like, well, how do you see, see yourself? trans and all those things now that's a good question i said the the transness really shows up in my gender and my body dysphoria and those are two things that are not always visible but they're active in me every day i can't get away from my wake up and i'm like i should have a penis that is a real thought that comes up in my head also but i also know that i have some restraints around like i have some some cautions around that um, but that's not going to stop, you know? And so, like, asking my homegirls, asking my cousin, they're like, nah, cuz, we don't, we don't think like that. We don't, mm -mm. and I'm like, okay, it's just me. They're like, yeah, no, nah, nigga, it's just you. And I'm like, that's cool. Um, and then asking my friends who have transitioned, I was like, yo, this is this is what I think about in the morning. I'm like, yeah, nah, cuz, you, you on par, what you going to do? Um, and so just letting them know that that's the reality portion of it. The experience is actively changing and so everyone's involved in that experience the reality is like it's not gonna fucking stop this is not going to change i'm gonna so um and the other half is like outside of like certain attributes and like physical appearance there's nothing that i innately do that's feminine not even on like accident it's just like it's it's me so it's very purposeful and so it's like I don't have no, I don't have that shit in me. My kid, and I, so like telling my students that they're like, okay, I get it. But having been able to have the conversation with them around the why, you know? So I have some kids who they're questioning what transition for them looks like, you know? And they didn't know that there are like ticks within the transition spectrum. And kind of like giving them some comfort around, you can do it, just do it the right way. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's gonna be a hard conversation to have with your people if, they've never heard of it before. You know what I'm saying? So if it's not gonna be your folks, have a safe place, you know, have a, a guidance counselor or a mentor, or somebody that you can trust, that at least is not like your homie on the corner, but they have some know-how with them. So if it's not me, let's find somebody older. I said, but if you do have that support with your family, actively start telling your family, not so much that they have to be okay with it, but the why, you know what I'm saying? Why wearing a binder helps you feel more in your body. You go and talk to them about planning your surgery day. Don't wait for anyone to do it for you. Say, okay, mom, this is what I'm thinking about. In <coughs> six months, X, Y, Z might happen. Can you help me with my teachers get my work? Or can you call my principal and say that I'll be out for school? Like, your parents can step in that way. I said, because once you start to take this on, the world is not always nice. And so it's going to be on you to be responsible of a lot of stuff, which is why I, I understand, like, kids transitioning early, but... I'm one of those, let's give you some time so you can gain that know how to take care of yourself because your folks are supposed to support you, but they're not supposed to do, do it for you. You know, they're not supposed to come in, fight your battles. They're not supposed to come in, always save your hand when somebody misgender you or whatnot. Like you gotta go through that shit on your own. So, um, and then letting them just know like, it's gonna, it, it'll, from like talking to my friends who've had top surgery, who've had bottom surgery, you know, all the surgeries you can, that you can talk about, like, after the surgery, they go through, like, the invisible limb kind of kind kind of, of deal, right? Of, like, holy shit, it's gone. And then, like, there's some regret, and there's some regrets, like, I didn't think that 
taking that away would feel both and, right? I feel great and I feel like shit because for the past some teen plus years, I've had this. You know what I'm saying? And now that it's it's gone, it's a relief, but it's like, what do I do next? Like, because now this is permanent. You know what I'm saying? So what do you do next and how do you move forward with that? Like, how do you move forward when people just saw you last week with breasts and now you don't? It's a significant difference. What are you going to do? Are you going to shut yourself away? Are you going to come out and be like, this is who I am? Are you going to be in the middle? Like, so just having those precursor conversations I think is just valid and I'm grateful for my therapist because as I'm readying myself for top surgery those are the conversations that we're having they're understanding that like you're going to get this done but let's just keep having these revolving conversations so that you so that I know that I'm strong enough and so that I know that I have gone through this and I have written down notes so I have a manual of when I feel like this I, I said this shit two months ago or five months ago whatever whatever right okay cool um and just moving forward in that space and then understanding that like I'm gonna have those moments of holy oh, shit I did it you know what I'm saying my mom is not gonna be happy so what does our relationship look like moving forward really dealing with that you know what I'm saying my family is not gonna understand and really dealing with that um and then there's some people gonna be like all right, cool. Keep it moving. And really dealing with that. You know what I'm saying? Because especially like within that first two years, I'm going to, this is what I've read and this is what I've read and like heard about. But like there's a space you go through where you kind of want people to be more involved in the process. And after a while, they, they like, yo, I'll move on to the next thing. They're like, your tit is gone, not mine. And so being okay with like, all right, I'm going to walk around. And then being okay with like going out in public topless. Or shirtless, you know what I'm saying? And like, not transitioning. What does that look like? I gotta do it because what's the point of me going going through that and just not living in my full body, right? So all those steps are just a part of my thought process, but it helps me get to like, I gotta do it because I gotta answer these questions. Now I gotta get them answered. Is there a risk with children transitioning too early? I think so. Um, depending on the family's connection with their therapist and like their transition team, if they're not ahead of the kid's age by two years and preparing for what that looks like, it's going to hold that kid. I, I feel it's going to have some, some not drastic impact, but it's going to impact that individual, um, especially socially, um, and in some regards, educationally, um, <clears throat> And I really can't like pinpoint a why, but that's just what I feel, right? I feel that like, now if a kid is born intersex or the medical term for hermaphrodite, um, then those are the ones where I'm like, no, nah, we, we just gonna go ahead. And th so actually those are where I feel the parents should wait a little bit and then them, like a therapist and the kid have a conversation based on like, observation assessments and the kids voice around what what you feeling you know what i'm saying like if we looking at homie and every day he waking up and they want to be standing up then we have a clear indication of where this thing should be going right um but then we have and we, you know we have children who body and gender dysphoria um is is impacting them and so the parents want to support them the parents want to get them in their right body but always not acknowledging and sometimes even the therapist always not acknowledging like developmentally kids are going to have this right kids are going to have this curiosity around body body awareness um body type if you allow a kid to express themselves freely they're going to wear different clothing they're going to wear boys will wear girl clothes and girls will wear boy clothes i think it's indicative of like how, how how they're raised at home and their access to just be kids um and and so like let's say we have a kid who has had all that access to the great resources and you know parents aren't condoning them based on the gender norms x y and z around like seven or eight they're still like but i don't feel that I'm in my right body. This kid is able to identify, this kid's able to say this, not the parents saying this is my observation and kind of coaxing the kid. Now this kid has real words to say, yeah, nah, this worked for me. Game on, you know what I'm saying? Like once we, once I, I feel, once we get there with the kid, 
then we can move forward and say safely, okay, you've had enough time, observation of yourself, self-awareness, your family to kind of know what it is we look for, what it is we're looking we're looking at. Okay, let's move forward. But babies who are like four, five, and the parents are like, oh yeah, I came home one day, which happens, right? Said you want to be a girl. Cool. Absolutely. And then when mom reinforces it or dad reinforces it with affirmation, which is great, the kid is like, oh shit, I'm kind of stuck in this space a little bit. So I got to dress like a girl all the time. All the time. Because I, I, I listen to the, I, I read, right? And so there are some kids who are like, I don't want to dress like that all the time though. Like, you know, it's, some, it's fun some days. This is, this is their time to develop. Now, if little Tommy keeps saying that well through elementary school, by the end of fifth grade, baby, I got you. We 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 finna go and get all this stuff taken care of. So come sixth grade, we 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 moving forward and what feels right for you. Cause I think parents want that placement for their kids way more than well before the kids want it. I think parents just want their kids to know that they belong and have a place in the world and they wanna kinda put them put the kid in that place as quickly as possible and kind of forgetting like they may not they may not have the same feeling in two minutes let alone two years as an educator what is my responsibility to children not to be their parent <laughs> I will not be your parent but I will definitely be a, a resource I will definitely be a, a buffer I will definitely be a middle ground to provide information that your your folks may not be aware of. You don't know a difference of how to think around it, right? But I'm not your, I'm not your parent. Um, I'm responsible for challenging them academically so that they are able to see their success rate, what their goal is. I'm not responsible of the academic success. But giving them the tools to reach it and watching how they utilize it, teaching them how to utilize it, I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for some level of social connection um, because we spend eight hours of the day together. So we got to learn how to, at the basis, communicate respectfully and accordingly, even if we don't agree. So um, in, in that, it is kind of a heavier responsibility because now we, we get to talk about the power and the implication of words in general and how to use them throughout the day. Um, whether you're in math class, gym class, whatever. And how those words kind of um, create who you are, um, how they um, facilitate connections, um, why that's important. So I think that's my responsibility as an educator. <laughs> from okay so from what I've seen do I think that my responsibility to students kind of like reshapes how I think about parents and education oh shit yeah cause like either parents are not having the conversations with kids or parents stop thinking that these conversations are being had and the parents are my age and so i'm like what has happened i get it so i raised me and my ex-wife she's 21 now but we raised raised a daughter and so we thankfully and i'm more so grateful because of her and her know-how we just had a bunch of conversations with with the kid we were just like telling her like look if you gonna smoke weed when you smoke weed bring your own shit yeah yeah Take your own stuff, you know what I'm saying? Don't don't reach nobody else back if you don't know them. Even if you know them, if you don't know where they got it from, do without. If you get drunk, give us a call. If you don't feel safe, give us a call. And then we had to show that when she did it, we were okay with it. And I think that's the part that parents don't want to do. They don't want to say, okay, I know my kid gonna mess up. And then when they mess up, you fly the coop on the kid like you 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 like you throw a whole hell hell mary pass and like leave the kid out there by themselves with the whole oh you grown figure it out no 
this kid is actively telling you, I'm not, which is how I made this mistake. So I need for you to, <laughs> to be a parent and come in and holler at me. So um, when the parents don't do that, of course, the next day or, the, or that day, the, 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 the kids come in and they're still processing from whatever took place the day before the morning of. And now, now that's my, where my responsibility kind of changes because I, I got to worry about you. You know what I'm saying? I got to worry about if you're okay. I got to worry about what's going to happen to you um, when you leave this space because clearly nobody's talking to you because they think you're too grown and they think you this and the third. It was a young man that just got expelled from the school. This kid, 16 years old, got a colostomy bag, got shot. Coming from school, the school sits between two hoods, right? So he's already in the space of, I don't know who's after me and I got to go to the school, okay? Long story short, they found some guns on the kid, found an extendo. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They were not all his, he, he just took the rap. So it's a lot built into it. The first thing that no, no one's saying like kind of off rip, society then told this kid to handle himself and he didn't see what didn't happen when I, when I try to handle myself. I got a colostomy bag at 16. I got to change this joint at school. I really don't want to risk that again. This school shit is cool, but that's real. Like I was really in the hospital. I really had this IV in my arm. I really like, so they, he got, I mean, yes, you get expelled, right? But we as teachers get to ask the questions, where is he going next? And that'd be the hard part with some of the admin about feeling that, feeling, answering that question because now you, got, you get to say, I either you don't care, you don't know, or we're working on it. That's it. Like, <laughs> so if you're not ready to have that conversation, this kid is now put back into this bubble and the parents still are like, oh, you did this to yourself. I can't, so that's where I think it, it meshes that, right? I think overall parents have just forgotten or they're just assuming that, or I think, now that I'm saying it, I think parents are just hoping and praying, like for real, for real, my kid just get through. I don't even want to have a conversation if they're not bringing it to me because I don't want to open up that door. And I don't want to have it because they may know some shit that I'm not ready to hear. I really just want them to get through because it's a lot of stuff trying to take our babies down. It's a lot of stuff trying to get them every day. You know what I'm saying? And so me and my ex-wife's kid, like I say, she's 21 now. So growing up, she, like it was just a little different in like 2016, 2017 in comparison to now. Now, like, you know, kids come to school a lot more with guns. So as a parent now, I don't think I would be so worried about if my kid is like smoking weed as much as is my kid gonna get home safe, which is why the uptick around kids smoking weed, I think, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the anxiety, it's this, it's not being supervised, but I also think it's like the parents like, yo, you come home. You, you're home, you know what I'm saying? So, okay, cool, parents are like, you know, kids because the parents out more, you're home. I don't condone that one too much. It was like a rash of students at one point down south who was going around smacking teachers. Let me tell you something. I, 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 told, I told my students one of the few things I said to my kids at first. I said, child, if you want to, I will call your parent. I said, in the worst phone call your mom and your dad want to get is I to knock your ass out during the school day. They don't want to hear that. I said, so let's just not even play that game. I said, they do that shit down there. We're not doing it up here. Um, but just like, and not to, not to like highlight the story, but like the level of boundary crossing that these kids have, you know, like checking them at the door. Like, I know what you're capable of. I know you don't think I should say this to you, but I know that you think that you can try me a certain kind of way because I'm a teacher. But you want to remember it is not a threat. We're actual people who are going to respond a certain way. We're actual people who get upset about things. We're actual people who don't always appreciate certain remarks. And so we're just gonna live in this space mutualistic, in a, in a very mutual environment. Um, so, yeah. Why do schools in the hood have less school shootings? Wait. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, the young man that got expelled School was safe. He knew that it was a consistent routine with people who were 
on the same wavelength as him. And so that was like his home. He didn't want to really mess up his home life. What happened outside was outside. But school, these are my folks. I ain't gonna mess with them too much. And I also feel that That's a real good question, Juice. That's a real good one. I'm gonna have to eat off that one for a minute. That's a real good one. We gotta talk about that one because it's it's layered, right? It's it's looking at what the student is is participating in in the school day and what they're engaging in outside. It's looking at which one is real to them. You know what I'm saying? And and me, some people might think that like the the outside violence is real. That's not always it. That's just some. That's just something they gotta go through <laughs> to get to school, which is the real thing for them. That's how they are gonna make it out. And I think for some of them, they're like, I can't, I can't mess this up. This is my chance. I can't take this school thing like that. Outside stuff is, it's, it's gonna be. But if I wanna live, I gotta. This right here gotta be real. And I see that because I, it's some thugs at my school. You know what I'm saying? Like I go to a college career ready school, so everyone there is pretty much they. They, they got a good flow of rhythm around education, understanding, comprehension, but they still some thugs. But they make it a point to say, I this is how I'm making Miss Lynn. Like I I I gotta leave the hood. They were like, I grew up in this. I this all I know, but I, I don't wanna be in Maryland my whole life. I wanna leave and I gotta do it this way. And so they are like on this pinpoint focused mission to get out of high school, achieve great grades, first or second time, you know, only graduated high school in their family and they're like nah and the whole goal is to get out it's not to give back it ain't to stay around it's i'm i gotta leave i gotta live and so it that, that to me i think that's like like i said it's layered um some kids really are and it's gonna sound odd but they're really scared to live that life like a lot of our kids are engaging in the outside of the BS that happens in school, outside school violence. Like they be around it. They may take some videos. They may have been like a hype man in the street like that, but they, they may not be the shooter. You know what I'm saying? And then when they come into school, you gotta be face to face with somebody that you trying to have an altercation with. If you can't hold yourself down, you are not gonna do it in the classroom. Cause these classrooms are small. <laughs> and these some big kids in here too, right? So like, I don't have the advantage to run. So if you catch me, that's my ass. I'm God. And depending on the situation, it could, it's going to be a real long day. So like I said, I'm going to chew on it some more and we'll get back to that one. But like, that's what I got so far. It's just, it's layered. That's a good question because there aren't. Like, it's not a lot, of, especially in the hood. They ain't coming that. They not trying to come to school to shoot nobody. And you, he actively had a whole arsenal. If anybody pissed him off that day, he could have took out a whole classroom. We cool. We didn't even know. That's the thing. We didn't. They had been there for days. We didn't even know. Do you think that there's a better way the cops can handle the kids who have guns on them because they need protection going home versus they have guns on them because they came to inflict violence on the school? Do I think the cops can do better with the, with? With gun violence, if, if I'm trying to rephrase it right, but do I think the cops can do better with gun violence if a kid is either feeling threatened or if they actually are doing harm? I think if... And I, I may get some slack for this. I think we put a lot on police officers and not the department itself. Um, Explain. Gotcha. So the police department... I feel is meant to have those resources and classes and kind of like one-on-one -on -one implementation around social awareness, de-escalation tactics um, to provide to these individuals who are going into the street. Additionally, the police department is supposed to have, I feel, someone who is actively going through and assessing these people as they're gaining this knowledge and how they apply it to say, okay, you can or you cannot do this that's a little bit more stringent like almost going through college right I think there the academy needs to be really set less on field work and more on practical application work and what's being learned around cultural inclusion 
what's being learned around observing a threat, right? What does that mean when we think we see somebody observing somebody doing a threatening activity and then moving forward to apprehend them, right? Because um, other countries like China, Japan, you have to have authority to even unholster your weapon. To shoot, shoot a bullet, you got to sign them joints out. Like that level of scrutiny and responsibility and oversight is not big in a lot of the police departments here. And so if, and one thing I've learned in my school, if your department head has a certain way of thinking and a certain style of doing things, it just matriculates down to your, your department. So if the department isn't really seeing the need to have in licensed social worker, psychologists, people to come in and talk about schools and um, the community and actually these people, these officers who are to humble themselves a little bit to understand like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? If I move into a whole new neighborhood, I don't know nothing about where I'm at. So I can't walk in with a fear tactic if I'm trying to help. So that's why I feel that the police department is not the responsibility always of the cop. There is a lot of oversight that is mishandled um, because if, for me, if it was police officers, school psychologists and, counsel and, and a school guidance counselors would work a little bit more in tandem around situations. They would actually have a lot like at least meeting twice a week around what's happening with the students, what's happening with the community, who's a threat out, who, who's being threatened outside, who's a threat in this school, right? Since that's not actively happening, I'm like, I don't, police officers really are doing quote unquote, and these are like real like strict quotes because I know they bullshit and also the best they can, right? Because like going through my four year degree and now I'm working on my master's and I got into a doctoral program, so I'm going into special ed. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm doing that school board, here I come. The scrutiny around passing your classes to get your degree, like I took being a psychologist serious, right? I knew I wanted to do that. Behavior psych was my thing. Um, and I had like people behind me like, yo, you know, supporting that. So having to kind of go through that and then it was like this possible pass or fail kind of thing um, based on aptitude, right? Like from what I hear the police, the police force, you have an aptitude test, but really your field training is what kind of passes or fails you, right? So if you can't like run fast enough, if you got a little limp or whatnot, that could, like certain things, like specific things disqualify you, but if you don't sure how to like cite a reference paper correctly and it brings your whole grade down, that shit hit a little different because you're like, my my application sucks. You know what I'm saying? And so if I have a, a speech impediment or if I if I have a problem running, that's not so much as my application as I'm disabled. You know what I'm saying? And so those are things that I feel and I've learned how to disqualify qualify you from the police force. If they don't have that scrutiny around, yeah, but your application, your intellect, your emotional awareness around certain stuff is not here. This ain't for you. We, we're literally just putting out like, we just pumping them out. You know what I'm saying? And so it's a disadvantage to our students because we're asking them, trust the police officers. But these are the same people who will hear about the possibility of a fight about to happen. Let said fight happen and then pepper spray the kids. Why didn't you go talk to the school guidance counselors or a psychologist and go pull the kids out of class? Cause you don't, cause you don't want to go back and forth with no kid. You don't have to go back and forth with the kid. Stop the situation. Just pull them into the office. The minute an adult does that, I promise you, for the right kid, and then we'll learn. For the for the right kid, it'll switch, and then for the right kid, they gonna go back and forth. You like okay, like for real, for real, you about this life. So now I know how to address you. Now I know this other kid's life is in danger. Let me get you someplace. Let me get y'all both someplace safe. It's so many ticks that can happen before kids get into a fight when all the adults are working. Kids don't know how to hold a secret. They talk too damn much. So when knowing that, I, so that's why I'm like, Something is going on, and that's when I, kind of what I tell my psychologist at the school. Like, was, I'm, I'm grateful because our school psychologist, she does, she actually she actively talks to our police officers. You know what I'm saying? But and that's the first time I've seen it done. Other than that, unless it's for like an incident report or like a missing truancy or something like that, they don't talk. Which I'm like, y'all are both dealing with human and community services. 
She be snitching or she be concerned. Huh? She be snitching or she be concerned. She be. <laughs> she be snitching. Okay. <laughs> just kind of. Like, right, right, right. You're right, you're right, you're right. You're right. You're right. But technically, she's not snitching because she don't want to see her students get hurt. Right. Right. So concerned. Right. It's concerned. Yeah, yeah, concerned. Concerned, concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Snitching is when you are a part of the situation yeah. and you have promised to keep your lips sealed. Got gotcha. you. And now let beans fall all over now the, she concerned. the floor. She yeah. concerned. Okay, you're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. Yeah. When you be in it, I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of, not just mafia, but like a lot of our state of mentality is don't snitch. And it's like you guys do realize that a snitch is someone who's actually part of what's going mm -hmm. on and they've now changed sides mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. someone that's just around when the thing is happening that's a little bit different do you mm -hmm. have a personal relationship what do you owe these people mm -hmm. if the thing they're doing is messing up your pie and you never wanted to be a part of this and there's no benefits to it are you actually snitching mm. i like and that first half yeah this is a day in my shoes <laughs> 